Very good morning. My name is Sergio Carrera. I'm a senior research fellow at CEPS, and I will be moderating today's uh, webinar, How Could a Rule of Law Approach to Ethics Help to Restore Institutional Trust in the European Union? Questions of ethics and how to ensure integrity in European public administration are coming to the forefront of the debates ahead of the European Parliament elections. Distrust, citizens' distrust, legitimate questions regarding cases of uh, corruption, conflict of interests, revolving doors in European institutions are gaining ground in light of few scandals and cases that have arisen during this last legislature. There have been a number of initiatives put forward, particularly following the Cattergate uh, scandal, uh, in particular, the Interinstitutional Ethics Body, which has been finally uh, approved or given green light by the European Parliament um, after the Commission unveiled its proposal. Um, we shall discuss today these questions um, more in detail. We have a fantastic uh, panel, um, but also to um, perhaps also bring about a critical reflection on what do we mean by ethics uh, and how a rule of law approach to ethics may find ground to better understand uh, what has happened and also to find ways forward which uh, ensure also the effectiveness of uh, EU initiatives in this field. Um, we have, uh, before going into the panel and the keynote, um, I'm very happy to uh, give the floor to SEPS CEO, Karel Lanou. Karel actually has just published a new book titled Understanding Europe, Policies, Impact and Future of the European Union that you can see there. And um, we are uh, very happy to, to have Karel also to do the welcoming of today's session. So Karel, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Sergio. And it's a pleasure for me to welcome you to this session because I couldn't support more what Sergio and Julia and our team here on JHA is doing in SEPS and to have such a nice set of speakers, above all to welcome also Emily O'Reilly, who's been tirelessly advocating a stronger approach towards ethics in the working of the institutions at European level. To have the seminar today, but also it's very timely because of the European elections coming in this book, which Sergio just mentioned, I focus a lot on trying to make the European institutions more accessible for citizens. But then I see citizens see issues like what happened in the European Parliament with the Kylie affair, but also other things of which they have read in the meantime, they just wonder what rules are running, are managing, are governing this organization, and what is being done about it if there are these kind of uh, issues, which I would not only call issues of ethics amongst members, for example, of the European Parliament in that case, but also it happens also to high level officials in the Commission, or eventually in the council or another European institution, what the rules governs their way of working and what can we do about this? And if citizens do not see that the EU institutions officially react to what is happening and is, are incapable to controlling their own members, uh, then they may simply react in a way which we would like to have in European elections, which is now happening very soon. So what I, in my book, amongst others, criticize is that the reaction from the European Parliament on what has happened at the end of 2022, so already more than a year and a half almost ago, has been very weak. And that basically the Code of Ethics, which uh, was proposed, came only basically very late, I think, in the month of February or of March this year. And what we will be debating today, is this enough or is this uh, not enough? Um, I would say, as the way I see it, and it's explained also in the explanatory note of this meeting today, that such a code of ethics needs to have sufficient teeth to be seen to be workable. Um, and that's what we'll be debating today, whether it will have sufficient teeth, let's say, to make sure that trust of citizens and in European institutions can be maintained. So from my perspective, let's say all the support for this webinar today for the discussion about these these matters uh, the thing i would say is that this is not only a matter of ethics but it's also a matter of uh, basically sometimes growth neglect of basic rules if you accept bribes this is not only a matter of ethics this can also be a matter of uh, a criminal follow-up let's say before courts and that was in certain cases has happened 
So again, Sergio, thank you very much, let's say, for organizing this event. I think it is, as I said, very important for trust in European institutions that we, uh, European institutions are seen acting about this. Um, and I hope, let's say, we can have an interesting exchange of ideas on this matter and we come up with some uh, recommendations at the end of this webinar today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carol. And indeed, uh, these are questions uh, which brings us back to the core founding values of the European Union in the treaties, uh, elements like good administration uh, and rule of law when it comes to European institutions themselves. Uh, there's been a lot of focus on how certain uh, governments across the EU are backsliding on the rule of law. Um, how are European institutions um, taking their own path and their own way in fulfilling their obligations in the treaties? Now, you mentioned uh, the work of Emily O'Reilly. Uh, I'm personally also a, an admirer of her contribution uh, during the years and that of her office of the European Ombudsperson um, in upholding good administration uh, in European institutions. And we are delighted to have her uh, uh, with, with us today and we look forward also to her presentation. So, Emily, you have the, the floor. Thank you very much uh, and thank you for that lovely welcome and for inviting me to speak on the topic of ethics and the rule of law and I apologize in advance for my voice it's a little bit diminished but hopefully I will get through the next uh, the next 10 minutes or so so ever since the emergence of the Catergate scandal which is now 18 months ago people have wondered to what extent the issues at the heart of it would play a role in the forthcoming European Parliament elections judging from some polls it appears that the cost of living crisis migration geopolitical turmoil they all appear to have relegated the alleged bribery and corruption at the heart of the Parliament to the lower end of citizen concerns. Only 6% of respondents in a recent Eurobarometer poll believe that the next European Parliament should defend the rule of law as a priority over competing values such as peace and democracy. Perhaps this is to be expected or even welcomed. The rule of law, after all, is the operating system of democracy, the engine. When it functions well, it purrs away in the background, unobtrusively, we take notice only when it fails. Where the rule of law has been examined and debated in recent years, especially in Brussels, it has generally concerned the European Commission's fight against the authoritarian drift that is evident in some member states. In battles such as these, with billions of euros at stake, it is easy to think of the rule of law as a binary characteristic, something you either have or you don't have. In truth, of course, it's both a continuum, something you can have more or less of, and a composite, a combination of several distinct but related elements. And this needs to be kept in mind because if we say that the European Union institutions could benefit from a more forceful rule of law approach to its ethics framework, we should not draw a false equivalence between an imperfect ethics system and the considerably more alarming rule of law deficits on some member states. Even though, as we know, certain member states are very quick to defend their own misbehavior by pointing to Cattergate and other scandals. And that in itself, of course, establishes a link between the two. The European Union's ethics framework is still badly in need of a rule of law update. This is not to say that there is an absence of rule. On the contrary, the defining feature of the system has been the accumulation of rules after every major scandal from Cresson to Kylie. Each public outcry has been followed by new codes of conduct, more stringent disclosure requirements, more detailed definitions and elaborate procedures. And yet the ethics violations continue. Less than six months after European Parliament President Metzola completed her ethics reform plan, fresh allegations of MEPs accepting funds from Russian and Ukrainian sources in return for disseminating Kremlin talking points have emerged. The Council of Europe's Venice Commission's rule of law checklist includes, of course, independence, impartiality and equality before the law, but critically also notes that, quote, the duty to implement the law through the consistent application of dissuasive sanctions, the operational independence of bodies responsible for applying those sanctions, and, of course, the adequate resourcing of those bodies. These gaps are most apparent in those areas which have the highest risk of unethical conduct lobbying and trading in influence. Two vital initiatives for regulating conflicts of interest in these areas arguably fall short of the Venice Commission checklist, and they are the EU Transparency Register and revolving door restrictions. The Transparency Register is the most important pillar in the EU's efforts to show how policy is shaped. However, there are major concerns that it is under-resourced 
and fails to capture what is needed for an accurate forensic accounting of who influences EU legislation and how. There have been repeated media and civil society reports of the disparity between what some entities report in terms of personnel and resources and the visible on the ground reality. Another issue with the accuracy of the register is the extent to which companies or sectors engage in what is called astroturfing. That is, whether seemingly independent grassroots or civil society organizations listed on the register turn out to be funded or controlled by private interests. The credibility of the register as a tool to monitor possible conflicts of interest in the legislative process ultimately rests on the ability of the system to keep those who register honest. Yet there are serious doubts that it can do so. Earlier this year, one of our inquiries made a finding of bad administration against the Transparency Register Joint Secretariat with regard to a complaint it received about possible astroturfing. We concluded that the Secretariat did not conduct a meaningful investigation into the complaint relying instead on a highly formal tick box approach to assessing claims that is not in the spirit of the register. These concerns and findings are also echoed in the European Court of Auditors report on the register that was published last month. On revolving doors, the commission has put in place an impressive system for assessing risks and issuing formal restrictions on what activities its staff can engage in once they've left the service. However, multiple investigations by the European Ombudsman across the institutions have shown that it is often impossible meaningfully to police these restrictions. There is a reluctance to forbid former staff from taking up positions, even when such positions manifest the most serious conflicts of interest, such as when a former chief executive of the European Banking Agency decided to join Europe's biggest financial services lobbying association. The case of former Digital Affairs Commissioner Neely Cruz, who decided to take up a position on Uber's board of directors, has also raised concerns. The fact that an OLAF investigation into the affair concluded that there was no evidence that she broke any rules may have been greeted as an exoneration by the former commissioner, but others believed that it was the rules and OLAF's evidence gathering ability that were implicitly condemned by the report. Our office has written to the Commission to ask them to reassure the European public that the system will survive another important test when the mandate of the current Commission expires later this year. But the Commission does at least recognise the potential of conflicts of interest when it concerns revolving doors cases, even if that recognition isn't always backed up by action. At European Parliament level, the inherent conflict of interest on display through the right of MPs to have what are called side jobs is barely regulated. A recent survey by Transparency International showed that one in four have an income generating side job, a survey which also instanced cases of side jobs appearing directly to conflict with the parliamentary work of the side job holder. There is also a worrying tendency to minimize the impact of these phenomena on the integrity of our democratic decision making processes, despite the fact that the impact on well being and livelihood is real and well documented. In the last decade, for example, Americans have, exper have experienced an unprecedented rise in mortality and a decline in life expectancy unique to the developed world. Much of in this increase is due to the so-called deaths of despair, such as from alcohol and drug poisoning. Much of the focus has been on the bribery and fraud perpetrated by one company, Purdue Pharma. However, overseeing the opioid crisis was the US Food and Drug Administration. In the Purdue case, the two principal FDA reviewers who originally approved Purdue's oxycodone application both took up positions at Purdue after leaving the agency. Over the past 20 years, several other FDA staff involved in opioid approvals also left the F FDA to work for opioid ma makers. Europe's fatal addiction over the last decade has not been to prescription opioids, but rather to Russian gas an addiction that has proved no less deadly for thousands of Ukrainians, as it very likely emboldened Putin's regime to make the gamble that it did in February 2022. This dependency was steadily and deliberately nurtured through a strategy of co-opting members of the political elite across the EU, often via the revolving door into well-paying positions at Russian state-owned companies, including, most notoriously, the ex-German Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder, who sits on the board of Gazprom. 
I have no doubt but that in decades to come, we will also be able to trace a line from failures to tackle the climate crisis to similar phenomena. How many lobbyists, how many former EU institutional insiders will be found to have worked to prevent, delay or dilute necessary climate action? How many lives and livelihoods will be lost as a result? We cannot be complacent. And yet complacency is written all over the final agreed text that is the basis for a new interinstitutional ethics body. The last minute efforts of the European People's Party to sabotage the proposal might have given the impression that this was a revolutionary proposal, but that is not really so. We have seen in the two preceding examples that the flaw that runs through most ethics initiatives at EU level is twofold. Firstly, there is the failure to give adequate thought and resources to the challenging issue of implementation. And secondly, there is the reluctance to contemplate meaningful sanctions, a reluctance rooted partly in the absence of an adequate legal basis, but also in large part because ethical violations are judged by peers or former colleagues who lack the required independence. Despite the welcome addition of five independent experts to its ranks, the new ethics body will not remedy this deep flaw. Its main function will be to agree common standards rather than to police existing ones, a task that will remain the responsibility of the patchwork of existing ethics committees that have been set up by each institutions. The independent experts will be consulted only should one of the institutions decide that difficult or contentious cases need a second pair of eyes. Finally, all of this shows the lack of any shared political appetite for the kind of robust ethics regime that many citizens could have imagined was originally proposed by Commission President von der Leyen in her political guidelines. An interinstitutional ethics body may exist in name, but its nature is far from what was widely understood to have been implied back in 2019. This is not to suggest that nothing has changed or that improvements will not be made. The proposed new ethics body, even if toothless when it comes to investigating or sanctioning, could at least compel the institutions to look at their own ethics regimes, to compare and contrast them with those of other bodies, to defend their internal rules or be forced, if only by peer pressure, to strengthen them. At the very least, it puts the matter of ethics much more front and center of institutional thinking than was previously the case. But key components of the rule of law, independence, and the even-handed application of dissuasive sanctions remain elusive. In its place, we have, I would suggest, rule by lawyers, a highly legalistic system of rules and derogations that can be relied upon to give the institutions the answers that they want. The EU deserves better than this, and EU citizens on the doorsteps, in the town halls, should demand more. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you for your excellent presentation. Uh, the EU deserves more, uh, you've mentioned. Um, and um, you've also highlighted how the rule of law um, you consider as the engine of democracy. Um, in your presentation, you pointed, pointed out a number of elements that I'm sure we will come back during the, during the panel. Um, I mean, it is really fast, really astonishing the, what you mentioned on the revolving doors, the, the conflicts of interests and, and also the side activities of MEP, something that is still is outstanding. And, and also your comments on the transparency register. Well, thank you so much um, for your presentation. Um, my colleagues have reminded the participants, we are very grateful for all of you who are, who are participating in this webinar. You have the Q&A option uh, in Zoom. Um, so feel free as from now onwards to include any comments or uh, questions that you have. Please also include your name and, and affiliation. I will be taking those questions to the panel, which we now open um, following the keynote. So we have uh, three speakers, starting with Professor Emilia Korkea Aho, University of Eastern Finland. This will be followed by Shari Hintz, uh, it was mentioned before, the work of Transparency International, one of the key leading NGOs calling for, indeed, the Transparency uh, European Union decision-making and institutions. We are very glad to have you, uh, Shari. And then Julia Potse, research assistant at SEPS, who has written a wonderful commentary that is available in our website um, dealing with these uh, topics. So starting with Emilia. Emilia, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, and thanks for the invitation to uh, discuss 
ethics, the rule of law, and public integrity. Um, when thinking about what to say today, I decided to reflect on these topics in light of my ongoing research, which focuses on a lobbying and revolving doors. And particularly this academic year, I have um, thought about both in the international versions, meaning foreign lobbying and international revolving doors. And I think these two um, topics provide the context for my thoughts in this webinar today. There are two things that really bother me about the discussion on ethics in the EU, especially after Qatar Gate. Um, first is that the, um, the EU perceives itself as being under attack rather than as an active agency or a, a agent capable of promoting ethical conduct. Second, to me, it seems that the EU behaves as though member states are somehow ethically inferior or weaker uh, entities or parties, rather than openly recognizing that it has its own domain to manage and, and sort. So for, for instance, take the recent directive proposal uh, given last December, which concerns member states that should be establishing registers for those representing uh, third countries. But it's not the member states that had Qatar gates, it was the EU. And to be a little bit of provocative, um, I think that when discussing ethics in the realm of politics, we care a little bit too much about the ethics of lobbyists, revolvers, companies, stakeholders, and now sort of foreign governments. I mean, it may sound almost like a, a trite thing to say, but we should prioritize examining, uh, examining how members and staff of the EU deal with those actors because the primary ethical responsibility when it comes, for instance, to lobbying and revolving doors lies with the EU itself, not foreign government or, or lobbyists. Um, here, I don't, I don't really want to imply that the EU has simply rested on its laurels because it hasn't. Every scandal, um, as we heard, um, has brought new rules and um, reinforced code of conduct. And the EU has attempted to restore uh, popular trust by updating ethical standards and now uh, by suggesting the uh, ethics body. Um, I'm a Finn and coming from a country with a high level of trust in its political system, um, it's, it's sort of clear that the trust can be easily undermined, but only slowly uh, uh, rebuilt. And simply having high ethical standards or even its implementation in place isn't enough. Because to me, it seems that the decision makers must be seen as respecting them in action. And unfortunately, it is, for example, too late for the upcoming elections. Um, uh, and then now returning to the uh, topic of um, EU ethics body, I'm sort of reluctant to dismiss the whole um, uh, plan uh, for the body. But I think in this matter and in others related to ethics, regulation favours self-regulation and self-policing and, and self-monitoring. And besides this do-it-yourself approach, another crucial aspect of EU ethics regulation is transparency. It's, it's always transparency, and I'm not saying that transparency isn't enough, but sometimes I wonder that why... Um, is it left to the public, transparency NGOs or investigative journalists to assess the interest being represented? And the third point is that um, the ethics uh, system is 
really complicated. I have studied uh, lobbying regulation in the EU and now uh, also at the uh, national level for years. And it's always an awful uh, thing when someone, journalist, calls and says, could you please briefly explain to me how the EU regulates lobbying? And it's just almost like, I, I always like, how much time do you have? Because I will need more than a uh, one or two minutes. So um, I think this is one of the um, major um, problems with the um, the ethics, although I was only talking about lobbying, but I think it sort of applies to the whole uh, ethics framework. Uh, one of the um, one of the questions I have received um, uh, last week concerned um, sort of the um, need for structural changes. So, what structural changes need to be implemented, and. Suppose I'm being a little bit pessimistic here, but I don't believe that structural changes alone are sufficient, not even as the initial step to be taken. And the reason is that I think we need more like a um, shift in in a sort of attitude or um, um, outlook. For example, it has been suggested that especially MEPs act as if they are above the law and that there has emerged or has been a culture of impunity. Um, and I don't doubt this. I think it's probably a fair diagnosis, but I think there's something else as well. And now I sort of return to what I said in the beginning. Um, before any structural changes, the EU must abund abandon its sort of victim mentality because following Qatar Gate and even at present, the EU, and now I'm not talking about any particular institution, I'm talking about the whole EU uh, bureaucracy, more or less. The EU frequently reverts to behaving as if it is threatened or undermined. And there's a connection between how the EU deals with its own autocratic member states and its approach to third countries. Because I think in both in instances, the EU prefers to be seen or sees itself as being under attack or threatened rather than highlighting that, yes, I mean, there's something we can do about this, and we have agency in defending the rule of law and promoting ethical governance. Because I think it's clear that the EU is not under uh, attack from external forces. I think when it comes to ethics, the threat is internal, and it's not internal in the sense of, of, of some member states. I think it's it's internal in the sense that the EU has not addressed its responsibility to first establish clear and un unambiguous rules, nor has it effectively asserted or exercised its ethical authority. I have recently looked at what the EU has done in terms of foreign lobbying, friendship groups, and sort of international revolving doors, and the finding is that despite its relatively busy image, not that much. And I'm also wondering that what kind of signal the EU will then send globally when it's sort of seen being busy with these things. But um, I mean, I think it's sort of, um, um, there's a risk that EU will be seen as a weak when it comes to having a ethical authority. And then I think it has implications for other regulatory domains because the EU has um, sort of authority when it comes to regulation in various domains. And if this is one area where the EU um, is seen as, as a weak uh, regulator or authority, I think it, it, I mean, the implications for other domains uh, are not that uh, great. And I also want to address, and this is the final point, um, the EU's attempt to regulate, now I, I will go a bit beyond ethics, but just talking about democracy more um, in, a, in a broader sense, that the EU's attempt to regulate democracy um, is sort of similar um, to how he, he has regulated markets for almost 70 years. And I think it's sort of... Um, 
um, um, uh, ineffective. There are obviously issues um, in terms of, for example, legal basis, but also um, regarding the substance um, of, of regulation. I recently suggested that when, it, for example, in the third country government's a directive proposal, the EU seems to be thinking that it can certify foreign agents um, similarly to how it certifies sort of food items. So it thinks that the, somehow the democracy and markets can be regulated in a in a, a similar way. And I think this is uh, this is a mistake. And we should also think about sort of probably almost like a new uh, regulatory philosophy when it comes to uh, democracy and, and ethics. So, but I think this is where I will end and thank you. And that's a wonderful ending note, a new regulatory philosophy. Thank you so much also for bringing it back to where it belongs, the responsibility. Uh, you've made it very clear where it belongs, uh, the EU itself. Uh, also the EU not seeing itself all, only as a victim, but it has clear agency in these uh, fields and it has enormous repercussions as you've very well explained both internally, also Emily mentioned this, uh, impacts on people, but also enormous repercussions in, in across policies. So we are very glad to, to come with you, uh, Emilia, in today's uh, conversation. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Shari. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm grateful to be here today at this uh, important uh, webinar. Uh, I would like to thank again the organizer for providing me with this opportunity to engage in the discussion on such pressing matters. Uh, today, we find ourselves at key moments for transparency, accountability, and the rule of law within European public administration, especially in light of the uh, upcoming EU election and the evolving landscape from 2019. Uh, this concept uh, quite often seem uh, as abstract, uh, but there are fundamental principles that uphold the integrity and legitimacy of our democratic institutions. In today's presentation, I will be discussing the work of TIU in uh, political integrity and uh, accountability. Following that, I will uh, delve into key topics uh, such as Scattergate and the agreement on the ethics body. I will conclude uh, with a forward looking assessment of the integrity systems uh, within uh, the European uh, institutions. Let's begin. Uh, TIU is part of the global anti-corruption movement, Transparency International. Our mission is to prevent corruption and promote integrity, transparency, and accountability in the EU institutions, policy, and legislation. TIU raise awareness using social media and website. Our advocacy work focuses on identifying loopholes in the ethical EU institutional framework through uh, blog posts and uh, comprehensive reports. Based on this analysis, we develop key recommendations that we use as advocacy demands. Our advocacy is data-driven and a central role is played by uh, our flagship platform, Integrity Watch. We use the platform to provide a comprehensive overview of lobbying meetings uh, in uh, the commission and parliament, as well as uh, members of the parliament's side activities, shedding light uh, on potential conflict of interest. By offering transparency, Transparency, uh, transparent and accessible data, we empower citizens to hold their elected representative accountable. Transitioning our focus to transparency and accountability. These are crucial for the protection of the rule of law at the EU level. The rule of law uh, serves as a fundamental principle of the EU legal system, requiring uh, institutions to adhere to principle of good administration and governance. Transparency and accountability are essential mechanisms for ensuring that these principles are maintained. Our only higher uh, ethical standards within European institutions contribute to restore citizen trust in the EU as well. This is even more crucial in the light of the imminent election, anticipated to be more polarized than ever. This recent year have been marked by uh, various allegations and scandals with the Qatar Gate scandal standing out as the most significant, posing a profound uh, challenge to the institution's uh, uh, integrity. In light of this, uh, restoring public trust is central. 
it is imperative that citizens are reassured that transparency and integrity are key priorities for the EU institutions. At TIU, we believe that there is a need to strengthen the EU integrity framework through monitoring, oversight, and effective sanctions. These structural changes will rebuild the public trust and ensure ethical conduct among EU policymakers. TIU has been advocating for these reforms for years. Regrettably, not even the Qatargate scandal could prompt these changes. Parliament concluded the reform process in September 2023, and we acknowledge the introduction of some reforms, uh, such as the requirement for members to uh, disclose all lobby meetings and asset declaration at the beginning and at the end uh, of uh, term in office. Nevertheless, we still find the overall reform process lacking. There has been no rapid transition away from what we call a culture of impunity. Members are still allowed to conduct uh, side activities and there, are, there is still no monitoring and oversight of activities in general. Turning our attention to the agreement on the ethics body, it is important to note that this body could have facilitated the, the transition towards higher ethical standards and could have complemented the current ethical oversight framework. However, after uh, waiting for almost five years for the agreement, uh, the agreed upon ethics body falls short of being an institutional watchdog capable of promoting a meaningful change in the ethical systems of the institution. A few positive aspects include the ability to consult the independent uh, expert on declaration compliance and the mandatory annual reporting uh, on the body activities. What the body is truly lacking are investigative and sanctioning powers. This renders the body unfit for purpose. The agreed body can be seen as a starting point, strengthening its mandate and ensuring adequate resources are essential step towards enhancing its efficiency. Uh, as we reflect on the 2019-2024 mandate, we need to highlight that uh, this has been marked by significant uh, scandals, uh, prompting tentative reforms and a renewed uh, focus on institutional integrity. What Qatargate, Pipergate, uh, uh, inter different kind of interference uh, and other ethics allegations have proven is that structural changes are needed now more than ever to move away from a culture of impunity and self-policing. We need an effective ethics body with the adequate resources and more transparency. Above all, we need the introduction of, of effective uh, monitoring, oversight, and sanction in the integrity framework of the EU institution. In conclusion, building a strong ethical system that includes monitoring, oversight, and deterrent sanction is imperative for promoting accountability and integrity within the European institution. It is only through the establishment of such system that EU citizens can be reassured of the commitment to respecting ethical standards and restoring trust in the governance process. With less than one month to the EU election, it is time to empower citizens with the confidence that their voice, voice are heard and their values have held, ensuring a new fresh start for integrity and transparency across the EU. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shari, and also thanks uh, to the work of Transparency International and your contribution in fostering more transparency and accountability at EU level. Uh, next speaker is Julia. Julia Pozze. Julia, you have the floor. Sergio, and uh, also hello and a very warm welcome to this webinar from my side. Um, just to start off, this was a passion project for me, uh, and I'm very um, grateful to see that we managed to uh, sort of make it an official SEPS thing so that it's not my passion project anymore. Um, and I hope I can convince you that it should be your passion project too. Uh, so just to uh, give a very brief overview of what I'm going to say, um, I started examining this topic from a rule of law angle, uh, especially seeing that the elections are... Uh, yeah, almost there. Uh, and people seem to have, rightfully so, lost trust in institutions. Uh, so I wanted to assess uh, what we can do to change this and then whether this new ethics body is going to present a meaningful solution and uh, not to, uh, you know, kill the vibe in advance, but it's definitely not, as uh, the other speakers have said before me. So Qatargate has 
understandably made many questions, many people question the, the trust that they put uh, in European institutions. And I, I have personally heard people dismiss it by saying that, well, MEPs are just like the rest of them. Uh, on the one hand, uh, it's obviously devastating that we have learned to just expect our representatives to be corrupt, to accept bribes and undertake action that they know is against European interest. We, we have normalized that wealth, power and influence goes first instead of any resemblance of public service. Um, we have come to accept corruption, conflicts of interest and, and revolving doors is normal. Um, and in my personal experience, people tend to be indifferent about it. Uh, and they are reluctant to believe that institutional members can function any other way, that politics can be different than whatever this is. But on the other hand, this also made alarm bells go off in my head, especially before the elections, because this kind of normalized and, uh, and if you're honest, probably very well earned distrust uh, and general indifference towards doubling down on political integrity makes people all the more vulnerable to harmful propaganda, and susceptible to deliberate disinformation and, and of course malicious hate speech. So all of that can, can quickly fuel the far right, the extreme populists uh, and, and Eurosceptic groupings who reject EU values. And the EU already, as we know, struggles with reaching citizens and, and getting them to the polls. Um, but corruption scandals like Qatargate uh, is not gonna help uh, put, more, put uh, more voters into polling groups. So to restore and, uh, and boost institutional trust, the key avenue is not just to make big promises, but to actually follow up with meaningful action. I think that's self-evident. And the action uh, that these institutions take need to be accessible to the public so that citizens can play their own very important and essential role in keeping elected representatives accountable. And accountable, uh, accountability, as many mentioned before me, is a central word here. Transparency of public administration and governance alongside political accountability is a crucial element of the rule of law. I think that's a universally accepted fact. And, and after all, the, the uh, idea behind this notion of rule of law is that citizens, institutions, and politicians alike must adhere to and are accountable to the very same laws. So um, it shouldn't be tricky to hold leaders accountable, just like it shouldn't be tricky to hold citizens accountable for unethical conduct. Um, from this, it follows sort of that, that the comprehensive ethical oversight is absolutely essential uh, to all the core values of the EU. Uh, we often cite Article 2 uh, of the EU as the heart of the integration, and I believe rightfully so. Uh, but without political integrity, there cannot be real democracy. The EU cannot deliver equality before the law, justice, and fundamental rights, and there surely cannot be a functioning rule of law-based system. We elect MEPs and national governments to represent us. We delegate power to them with the hope that they will work for us and not only for themselves. Uh, therefore, since they are wielding the power that's technically ours, they must face strict scrutiny for their conduct and how they deal with the power that we give them. And, and on the other side, uh, how can we how can we accept uh, expect citizens to adhere to rules when the rich, powerful, and influential seemingly act like they don't have to? So to uphold our values and to continue this. European project that we have built over the past 70 years, we must not relent in, in fighting for a robust ethical oversight regime. And we also must do our own part as citizens and as people in, in holding the political level accountable. So the question then is, um, is the new ethics body the answer to our hopes and prayers and dreams? And I mean, uh, uh, as my fellow panelists said before me, it certainly is not. Uh, I acknowledge that the proposal has its heart in the right place. And it's definitely a step into the right direction. But um, even if the EP managed to add some valuable elements to the original proposal by the commission, it's, it's overall not nearly enough to sort of usher in this bold new era of accountability. I mean, first the self-policing as the uh, other panelists mentioned before me, uh, if, if, you, if you just think about Qatargate, the scandal was orchestrated by an NGO that called itself Fight Impunity, and yet they, they, <laughs> they did their best to hide the corruption and escape accountability for their wrongdoing. So clearly letting institutional members uh, to police themselves is not going to change this culture of impunity. Ethical rules need, need to be binding. Otherwise, no one would reasonably expect institutional members to live up to them. We, we have seen the immediate aftermath of Qatargate coming to light that First, MEPs were very keen uh, on disclosing the gifts that they have received, that the meetings they have taken, but, but after a while, this enthusiasm uh, of disclosure dwindled, and as time passed, um, most of them have gone back to the bare minimum when it comes to transparency. So these rules, 
must not only be binding, but they must also be uniformly implemented and uniformly enforced, which is not the case now and will not be the case with the new ethics body. Um, otherwise, uh, not, not much can come from a new institution like this other than uh, a very shiny lip service to uh, uh, an otherwise noble idea. Um, the body needs to be structurally independent, which is once again, as I would argue, not the case. Um, and with the council not participating in it, it's also not fully interinstitutional. It needs to cover all EU institutions. And um, lastly, uh, I, I just also want to mention that rules will be non-binding uh, and violation, as also the, the Ombudsman O'Reilly um, highlighted, will not be sanctioned. So there is not much uh, added value into this entire body. And, and overall, as, my, as the fellow speakers have pointed out, um, the EU's institutional landscape is incredibly complex. And as uh, the Ombudsman said, it's, it's like a patchwork. It's too complex. And I mean, at this point, uh, we in the EU bubble are happy when someone does not confuse the Council of Europe with the European Council. So how can we expect people to grasp how any of this work? Um, it's almost impossible to, to fully understand how ethical oversight is, is functioning in the EU. So, so we can't reasonably expect people to just follow up and keep, uh, keep the institutions accountable if they don't even know where to go. Uh, so I think this is a key reason why, uh, despite, as I said, being a step into the right direction, the ethics body is not a, not a good solution. It will make this landscape that's already very intricate and complex even more complicated. And uh, for everyone who, who wants to take on the mantle of holding institutions accountable, having a more streamlined, simplified structure would be very beneficial. And of course, I think more needs to be done to raise awareness for the fact that, that citizens can go to the ombudsman and submit complaints and, and actually access avenues to 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 hold uh, politicians accountable. So overall, due to the lack of effectiveness presented by this proposal um, in facilitating more transparency and then higher accountability standards, this is not not a good solution from a rule of law perspective. So to just to finish up to bolster institutional trust, the EU needs serious commitment to ethical oversight. You can either trust representatives to willingly participate uh, in comprehensive disclosures and not engage in any conduct that's even remotely unethical, or as experience has shown, we cannot trust each and every member to do this of their own volition so that there must be rules in place to, that ensure that they do so, whether they like it or not. So just to end this uh, on a less of a bummer note and a more of a call to action note before the elections, I just want to say that, reiterate that members of these institutions serve the European people and not the other way around. If we think that our elected representatives abuse the power delegated to them and do not act in line with our best interest, then we have the power to demand better from them. It is also not, not uh, it is also up to us to fight for more transparency and uh, accountability in politics. And we should definitely not sit idly by and accept and normalize uh, corruption as some sort of necessary evil in politics. So yes, uh, a more comprehensive and centralized system does need political willingness, which may not be a given at the moment, but citizens can put pressure on decision makers until they must develop some sort of political willingness if they want to hold on to their seats in power. That's what I was going to say. Um, I hope it wasn't too long and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Thank you so much um, for your presentation, reminding everybody that the Q&A option is open, so feel free to add your contribution and questions to the panel. I think we've uh, gone through a number of fundamental uh, issues uh, that come actually across, have come across the different presentations um, and which have brought light to some of the key questions and challenges that characterize the current framework, ethics, uh, EU ethics uh, framework, which uh, brings us back to questions of effectiveness. The question of uh, that you've, many of you have raised uh, as regards the new ethics body, the lack of independence, the lack of meaningful sanctioning and, and uh, investigatory powers, the lack of resources put into this, and uh, this kind of uh, lip service policy making that we call something uh, a so called ethics body, but can that body really deliver ethics? Can this body really deliver? on the promise uh, based on what we've heard. I mean, this is really uh, an open question um, as far as I understand from, from your, uh, your uh, presentations. Then there is the issue of this patchwork of committees and so forth, which has been this complexity by design. 
even for experts and for people who are following very closely, <laughs> it's extremely complicated to follow. So one can only imagine for uh, everybody else. Um, now, what does that mean in terms of accountability and access to uh, uh, who has access uh, uh, to, to these uh, venues and so forth? And also the question of overlapping. Uh, sometimes it uh, has been mentioned, uh, I think the European Commission uh, uh, saying we have already some EU agencies which are delivering in, in some of those aspects. How does this new ethics body, um, uh, so-called ethics body, uh, complement, uh, overlap uh, or leaves even wider gaps in relation to the work of other agencies? So um, there, have been, uh, there are a couple of questions before we bring it back to our panelists, um, perhaps they have some reactions um, to some of the points that uh, the other colleagues have raised. Uh, there are a number of questions which are actually very interesting. Um, for example, one attendee says, um, how can think tanks and NGOs um, um, uphold ethics uh, following a rule of law approach within EU institutions? Um, and um, I'm just reading another uh, question. Can it be argued that there might be a platform of NGOs and think tanks to strengthen ethics? This is one um, of the questions. Um, what about the rule of law reports by the commission? The commission is uh, uh, publishing annually uh, the rule of law uh, reports. Um, what role do you see in those reports? And this is also a question for, for any of you. When it comes to the importance of upholding ethics within European institutions, as far as I understand, those reports do not cover <laughs> European institutions themselves, <laughs> which perhaps is a huge gap uh, that could be addressed in the next legislature. Why not to include actually a section on um, rule of law uh, related aspects uh, at the uh, European uh, institutions? So let's start with these couple of questions. And if you have any reactions uh, in relation to what you've heard, um, Emily, will you do you have any um, input in, in light of the questions that have been raised or the other presentations as well? Well, first of all, they were really interesting and, and helpful to me in terms of how we frame our work. And just in relation to the point about the importance of NGOs and civil society, they're hugely important. I mean, I often say as ombudsman, I've you know, so much power, but when things are difficult, you need a coalition of influencers, essentially. Uh, and that can be media, uh, that can be within some of the institutions, um, uh, that can be academics. Uh, and it's only when it reaches a certain pitch point, if you like, that that uh, that things move. But I was very, very taken uh, by, by something that, 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 that Julia said um, when she noted at the beginning of Cattergate, everybody got terribly excited and, and Madame Metzela went out to, uh, uh, you know, ready to fight the good fight, though framing it as if it was an attack from the external, rather than seeing it, well, actually, it was your own people who were, who were involved in, in this. And I remember at the time, because you never like to be too, you know, you, you don't want to, I mean, uh, you know, I've said before that I believe in, in Madame Metzler's, uh, President Metzler's uh, bona fides, good intentions in relation to this. So you don't want immediately to say, nothing's going to work and you're not really serious and all of that. So I was asked a lot of questions at the beginning by various people in media as to when the her proposals started, you know, coming out and being debated, whether I thought they would work. And I said, well, within a day or two, I think, of Cattergate uh, exploding, there was a vote in Parliament to uh, remove the vice presidency position from Ava Kiley. And the vote was overwhelming. I think there was one person that voted against. Everybody in Parliament was yes, we have to we have to remove her from this. And I remember saying, well, you know, the day that you get the same percentage, the same overwhelming number of, of virtually unanimity, unanimity, um, supporting an interinstitutional ethics body with teeth, then I know that there will be change. And as we saw, there was a split, the EPP, as they see it, they fought their good fight to, well, they diluted it for a start. And then subsequently they tried to overthrow the, uh, get rid of what was eventually um, put up. So again, as, as I think the first speaker talked about, it comes down to political will. It comes down to culture. And all of us together can put down lots of ideas as to what would work and new rules, new regulations, blah, 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 blah. But honestly, unless there is political will and political leadership, at the very top, things will not change. And some things that were done, the things that were done were generally easy. The difficult one was the side jobs. 
And the difficult one, I remember Parliament, there was one proposal which uh, was defeated, which was to have three independent uh, people on the um, on the Parliament's uh, committee. And, and that was uh, that was uh, so. So we we're left with lots of stuff, but essentially self-regulation and uh, division within the parliament, roughly speaking, between left and right, more oversight, less oversight, leave us alone. We're independent. You have to respect our mandate. So let's see what happens with the interinstitutional body. But that, but that again will depend on the will, the people who are there to drive it. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other reactions? Also in light of the questions that have been posed. Emilia, Julia, Shari, any comments? Yes, Emilia. Thanks, um, I could uh, start. First of all, um, the issue of uh, complexity. Um, I We talk how difficult it is for us experts and then how much more difficult it is also uh, for the public. But sometimes I also wonder about people, the staff and the uh, politicians, because I suppose it's also, uh, it has become very complex for them as well. And uh, I wouldn't like to be an assistant to um, the member of European Parliament because I would not know how to be in full compliance with all the rules and standards are, that are there right now. So I think in a way, this system has become uh, such a maze that it's difficult for us experts, for the citizens, but also probably for the people um, who have to comply with those rules. So I think in a way it doesn't really serve anyone uh, um, any uh, longer. And I also had the feeling because last year I was doing some research on, uh, on um, lobbying transparency rules at EU agencies. And I needed a, re a part-time research assistant to go through all the different websites and trying to find all the rules and put them in an Excel sheet. And I mean, I can do that because uh, um, I'm lucky enough to have a research assistant, but if you are a citizen, you don't have a research assistant who can uh, go through the, all, all the websites and uh, see what kind of rules they have. So I think this system, I mean, it's not, manageable it doesn't really uh, make any sense so what about the ngos and think tanks this was one of the uh, questions um asked i actually i think they already do quite a lot and how much more we can expect from them and for example i think this is sort of related to my uh, comment uh, on transparency because we always like emphasize transparency and the more we have transparency the more responsibility we put on ngos and think tanks and all the activists to go through that information because transparency and having all the information out there doesn't really help we need people who are willing to go through that uh, material so in a way i think they already do quite a lot and i'm so happy that they they do quite a lot but i think it's it it's a bit like uh, unfair in a sense to say that we should uh, they should do more although I mean I'm sure that this is not what the uh, person who asked this question meant but in a way I think it's also good to remember that they do quite a lot and also um, um, the rule of law reports yes they don't cover the EU institutions and I remember when they first um, appeared I think I was a little bit skeptical but um, I don't know. I suppose they could have a um, some some impact, and um, and I mean this is just a very personal point. But I find them very useful because uh, to me, as a researcher, they also give me a lot of information about what's happening in other member states. But then they saw the policy impact. I don't know. Um, I used to study soft law for a long time, so I would like to say that soft law uh, can be effective. In a way, these are sort of soft tools to um, uh, implement changes, but I think I would like to be cautiously optimistic about the value. But yes, I think it would help to, to, uh, to extend their reach to cover EU institutions. And also, for example, CRECO, 
is also quite influential um, in member states. So I think Creco um, would also would be good if they covered also the EU institutions. So we would have sort of external feedback also uh, to the EU institutions. But um, yeah, I mean, I don't. I, I, I do believe that they can be. I'm not sure if they are effective yet. And I, I think it's, it would be probably difficult to to uh, argue that um, they have had an impact, but I think they might have in the future. So I remain uh, cautiously uh, optimistic about their value. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Emilia. Indeed, the participant was also highlighting the potential role that the annual rule of law reports could have in strengthening also an ethics dimension. Uh, at the national level, and indeed, as you mentioned, I mean, this is a commission product, meaning it's not independent. Uh, it's subject to politics as well inside the commission, um, both in terms of assessment and recommendations. Uh, in the current European Commission, which is very hierarchical, where the vice president cabinet and the sec gen uh, play a crucial role in what comes out uh, in terms of the assessments. Uh, so this is a component where uh, if we come back to the point where politics matter, in terms of what happens, uh, perhaps also to be considered when, when referring the, the value of the annual rule, rule of law reports for the next legislature. Um, so thank you for, for your comments. Uh, indeed, you mentioned the role of the civil society and NGOs uh, playing a role and uh, having the, that um, uh, potential input in looking through all these uh, different uh, sets of uh, different arrangements, mandates and, and workings. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, I see Karel raising his hand. Uh, Karel. Yes, thank you, Sergio. I had a question essentially for Emily. And thank you for this presentation, but which is rather critical if I hear you speaking. But my question was towards the future, which we always need to think we have, uh, of course, in this commission, we had the conference on the future of Europe. We have high expectations raised about uh, citizens' involvement. But is the problem not that basically your commission is not an kind of a, a body which is directly appointed by the European Parliament, which is much more intergovernmental, and that the whole EU construct is still rather intergovernmental rather than being federal, uh, which prevents us from acting on having a more direct uh, way in correcting forms of which we've been discussing over the first hour now of this webinar. Uh... Yeah, I mean, we're getting to, you're inquiring, we're all inquiring about what, what, what is the root of this issue. And obviously, you know, and this isn't making a political statement about which way I particularly want uh, Europe to go. If you had a more federal system, yeah, perhaps. Um, I, I think, you know, what we've witnessed, I mean, I, I don't know whether it's just me, but I get confused over who is actually wielding power sometimes. We have the commission at the moment with a very, ostensibly powerful uh, president of the commission um, uh, that has morphed from an ordinary commission to a political commission under under Juncker to a geopolitical commission uh, under Madame von der Leyen and I think as I asked one time well you know where where did how did how did that happen to what extent are the citizens involved in this transformation of the commission from the executive body who some people believe is just there to carry out the orders of the council into this geopolitical commission with Madame von der Leyen being very, very, been seen globally as, you know, the most powerful person in, in Europe and the person who, uh, uh, who um, you know, dictates so much of what happens. Um, so I, I think, again, the European elections are going to obviously um, uh show a lot i mean we're probably going to have the old spitz and candidaten issue again um parliament fighting for its right to propose whoever is the lead candidate at the end and the council saying no we want to impose our own and then you have issues around legitimacy there but i think more worryingly in relation to what we're talking about here is that there will be a shift to the right as we hear and now most commentary and i'm just reading what i what most of us are reading says that that the center will hold but the center will be a diminished center 
Uh, and when you look at you know, rule of law issues in the member states, and when you look at who was most vociferously opposed to significant change in the ethics rule, you can see that it was not even the far right, it was the center right. Um, so are we going to go backwards in relation to uh, to, to these matters? And, and that is highly, that is highly uh, problematic. So, I mean, the, the question you're asking is, is much deeper than that. I can only look at it from, I suppose, from a citizen's perspective, because they're the people who come to me wanting to, you know, have their problems solved or wanting questions answered. And I suppose they're rather confused about, you know, the, the power balance, um, who's, who's, who's uh, dictating the geopolitical direction of, of the Commission and to, and to what extent uh, do they have a say in this? Yes, we definitely need to be prepared uh, for going backwards, as you mentioned, to this eventuality of uh, with a new legislature, uh, the European Union institutions going actually backwards in upholding um, ethics and the rule of law. And uh, you've also mentioned very valid points in the when it comes to the so-called geopolitical role of the European uh, Commission, um, which brings back to the question of impartiality and representativeness and legitimacy of uh, not only the president of the commission, but also the role of vice presidents and commissioners. I mean, if in the next uh, legislature we will have more commissioners um, representing countries where you have a stream right parties with which uh, the current president of the commission has said she will cooperate with, uh, we know that those governments are not at the forefront either of um, upholding uh, EU values as we know them. Uh, so this is a very legitimate question indeed. Um, uh, there's also uh, a couple of questions before giving back the floor to Julia and uh, Shari. Uh, there's one participant who's uh, mentioned the issue of the legal basis. So we often hear the argument, of, oh, there's no legal basis for this. Um, and uh, one participant actually wonders about these uh, arguments, your thoughts about this. And another participant also about the concept in itself, ethics. When we talk about ethics, um, what, uh, what do we mean uh, conceptually? Uh, the Venice Commission definition of the rule of law was mentioned by Emily, which gives us uh, perhaps one of the stronger bases conceptually of what the rule of law means in, in the European Union. But uh, the participant also brings forward that question. And of course, any points that you have, Julia and Shari, about what has been mentioned before. Who would like to start, Shari? Yes, sorry. after many years with uh, COVID and everything, still struggling sometimes to unmute myself. <laughs> sorry about this. Uh, so um, yeah, there are very different interesting points that uh, that have been raised um, in terms of uh, there is no legal basis for this. I think this is one of the main uh, replies that we always uh, get as uh, Transparency International EU, especially when it comes to political integrity. Because we don't only work on political integrity, uh, we also work on uh, on other aspects like uh, rule of law, civic space, uh, initiate uh, financial flows. And when it comes to political integrity of the, Euro of the European institution, we actually advocate for changes within the institution. So this is sometimes a bit more difficult uh, than it is when we work on other other aspects aspects and uh, uh, for me the question of legal basis is very simple at the end when there is a political appetite and political will to change things this is 100 possible and and uh, it's not like the fact that maybe there is no legal basis should not preempt like structural changes and uh, for example, when we talk about the reform process on the on the following Qatargate scandal, there there were there was an occasion to change things. So there were uh, basically uh, a reform process of the of the rule of procedure and code of conduct of uh, members, and there still where there was the the, the legal possibility to change, they did not uh, Parliament did not uh, then fail to uh, introduce meaningful changes. And then uh, I wanted to come back on uh, on the question about the rule of law report. That is not something that I, I follow directly. This is another colleague that is following, but uh, 
something very interesting is that sometimes there, uh, at least on lobby, we find some uh, uh, recommendation by the commission that are very, um, very good, I would say, for, for some member states. And uh, the question there is, is why for the own EU transparency register, these uh, good recommendation and these positive aspects are not implemented. So we see that for the moment, the, the the EU Transparency Register is not uh, uh, truly mandatory, and there are uh, many uh, problems with the, with, the, with the register. If I start to speak about the register, it will take hours, so I will uh, we'll just say that it can be improved. And when uh, we see in the rule of law recommendations to improve uh, it, and that these recommendations and these aspects are not implemented in the own lobby register of the, of the institution, it's quite uh, uh, interpelling, I would say. Um, so yes, this is uh, what uh, I wanted to, to say. I will uh, leave the floor to Julia or other panelists that they want to contribute to this. Thank you. Thank you. Julia. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there's a bunch of questions and I uh, I don't think I have the time to to give a, a good answer to all of them. So let me just briefly uh, provide some, some, some quick answers. Um, concerning civil society and the rule of law report, um, I, I want to quote uh, Balaj Danish from the, the Liberties Union for Europe, who has long been advocating to for adding a civil society pillar to the rule of law reports. And I agree with that. I think NGOs and civil society in general are absolutely necessary for the survival of democracy. And in this very complicated web of politics and institutions and regulations, they are the ones who, who actually inform the public uh, in a way that's graspable and understandable to them. Without them, there is nothing. Uh, and, and on the rule of law report, it's also, I think, very different in for each member state, because I don't think many citizens actually take the time to read these, and that's also totally understandable. Um, so in many ways, NGOs give them information on this. And uh, the other thing about citizens is also pointed out by, by Balazs Danish is that this comes out in July, when there is not much appetite to to read these kind of things so close to a uh, summer holiday uh, so that it needs to be published uh, at the time of year when there is more attention and the second one is these member states frame the way these rule of law reports are viewed uh, in each of their countries i'm from hungary so i know very well that it's presented to hungarians by the government and by the widely government-owned media as some sort of attack on Hungarian sovereignty by the EU. So it very much comes down to how member states feed this information to the public through the media. So uh, therefore NGOs are absolutely necessary to cut through all this noise, this political noise, and, and inform people of the actual content of these rule of law reports. And on the, on the other hand, uh, these reports are also come sort of shy uh, quite shy from enforcement. So they point out systemic failures, and this is really nice. Uh, and I support the continuation of this exercise, but I do think more needs to be done uh, in, in terms of enforcing the rule of law. And that's the, the job of the commission. And uh, we have talked about this shift to a geopolitical commission. And I have to say quite candidly, as a personal opinion that I disagree with this because this is not what the commission is for. Uh, it shouldn't be a geopolitical player or shouldn't aspire to be, especially not when it's uh, to the detriment of European values and to the enforcement of values such as rule of law and democracy. So there should be more enforcement and uh, the EU should also perhaps rethink the way that the rule of law report is being presented and how much the narrative is controlled by each member state around these, uh, around these reports. So, so more must be done to deliver this uh, to the citizens. And I think NGOs are probably the best channels for people to, to get this information in a digestible manner. And as for the, the legal base as well, uh, uh, I'm, I'm a lawyer and this is something that's very interesting to me and as Sergio and I discussed it uh, at length. Um, and I know that this is the go-to answer from the institutions as to why the ethics body does not have any substantive powers. And I get that. Uh, but also, I think either way it comes down to political willingness. On the one hand, we could open up the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, I like to call this a, a software update because we have gone very, very, very long uh, without the software update. I think this is the longest that we have gone without a new treaty since Maastricht. Um, and times have really changed 
since 2006 or 2009 when, when it came to for, into force. And we really need to, to update the, the, the core framework of the EU to, to meet the challenges and demands of these times. So I would be, I'm a very big proponent of opening up the treaty and coming up with something new, but that again comes down to political willingness, but the EU must avoid getting into the same trap as what is happening in the US where they cannot even touch the constitution. Like that's a, that's an accepted fact. It's not going to happen because it's so polarized. So the EU really needs to, to do something very quickly and, and come up with, with a framework that's flexible and, and meets uh, the challenges of these times and is still not meeting the challenges of the 2000s because this is a different world uh, in, in every sense of the uh, of the phrase. If there is no political willingness, then I don't think there is political willingness to, to do some legal ac acrobatics and try to piggyback a stronger uh, ethics body on existing provisions in the treaties. So what it comes down to at the end of the day is really the will to do something about this. Um, at, whether it's through a treaty modification or not is really depending on, on whether uh, those who lead us want to actually submit themselves to, to strict theoretical standards or not. Um, yeah, that's basically it on my side. Thank you, Julia. You've highlighted the role of uh, time. So when these annual reports on the role of law are published and uh, the importance of a timely uh, publication and dissemination of their results, uh, you've also mentioned something also, Shari, that has been um, underlined by previous research, which is the linkage between the recommendations of these soft policy uh, tools with actual enforcement by the Commission as assigned by the treaties. Uh, the Commission indeed, the uh, role in the treaties is very clear, it's not geopolitical. <laughs> it is to be guarantor of the treaties and ensure consistency of those treaty values and principles, both internally and externally in foreign affairs, so to ensure consistency there. And yet there is this um, mismatch sometime between the recommendations that are put forward in the annual reports and the actual follow-up in terms of enforcement, um, depoliticized enforcement uh, of, uh, of uh, those recommendations and, um, and how they are framed as well. And the issues as, uh, in these reports by country, the role of, uh, again, impartiality when it comes to uh, the assessment by each country that is done by the commission um, uh, of, of each country. So something to be also uh, to be taken into account for the next legislature, how this is going to evolve and the extent to which this is going to uh, be taken into consideration or not. Um, Emilia, you've raised your hand. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, I also want to say something about the issue of legal basis because I 100% uh, agree with Shari and Julia that when there's a political appetite, uh, uh, there will be a will. And, and this foreign lobbying directive proposal that I mentioned is a good example of that because it uses uh, Article 114, which is sort of the market um, uh, legal basis. And if you read the uh, text of the proposal, Yes, it looks odd in certain places, and I don't think it's as uh, as strong as it could be because uh, the the choice of legal basis is uh, um, unconventional. But um, but again, it shows that yes, we can do this if we want, and I think this also quite nicely links to to what. Um, Ombudsman uh, Emily Riley said in the beginning that there's that sort of rule by lawyers because I think it's the institutions, uh, lawyers come up with these uh, ideas that we don't have a legal basis and this is not what we can do. So this kind of like a highly legalistic interpretation of what we can do with certain things. So um, um, so this is, was just a comment that I, I wanted to add here. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, it made me think uh, when we talk about political willingness, because this is a, a this couple of words that have come um, across uh, during today's webinar. When thinking of certain political groups not having the political willingness to have higher standards, I fail really to understand why. Why is there why is there any political willingness by any political group not to have higher standards? And what what are the justifications that are given for uh, watering down a proposal on integrity. 
and it's something that has uh, that you know <laughs> I'm struggling with in terms of who who wins with this. Well, I mean, they 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 get lots of justifications, very you know high end justifications in relation to that. I remember uh, uh, listening to Manfred Weber when when um, the justifications he was making for his uh, party's uh, opposition to even the as we I think most of us agree at the moment a a weak body. And, uh, you know, they all sound very, very high-minded and values and rule of law and all sort of stuff. I mean, they were sort of kind of taking the, the language of, of the other side and, and imposing it on, on his side, shall we say. But, I mean, it's very simple. They just they just want the freedom to do as, as they will. They do not welcome oversight. Um, and I know in, in my own situation, something I've never, I've, I've frequently, the EPP, uh, uh, opposed me for my re-election. They opposed me in, in, in 2013. They couldn't really oppose me in 2014 because I was the only candidate. Uh, and equally, they, they opposed my predecessor in in, uh, in his second mandate. So, you know, uh, I don't want to personalize this, but what it strikes me is that it, it's simply the, 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 the culture of, of, of the centre-right and, and the right that they, that they believe they can do pretty much... Uh, as they will, without without being, uh, without oversight by by an independent body. And could, could I just say something about this whole political geopolitical thing? I mean, I suppose when the, I mean, I remember Martin Selmayr, the former Secretary General of, of, of the Commission, and he said um, when you know this morphing of the of the Commission from being plain Commission to political Commission and then to geopolitical Commission, he said, well, the Commission was always uh, political, and of course, all choices are essentially political. But I don't think. There's ever been a commission, possibly, arguably, that's been as political as this. And politics involves making choices. And when you're making choices on the basis of politics, then you're veering away, really, from from the treaties and what somebody has has re reminded us. So the principal role of the of the commission is to be the, the guardian of the treaties. And we're looking at this centre right right issue in the parliament election. I was just reading a, a story over the weekend that. Uh, a new Croatian government has been formed by the, the, the centre-right aligning themselves to, to the far-right. And within a few hours of the outgoing uh, Prime Minister well being put in, back into office again, Madame von der Leyen was over in, in Croatia and, and praising that. So, so what, what messages, they're very mixed messages, for, uh, mixed messages for me, mixed messages for ordinary citizens. Like, okay, she's the head of the commission, so is she there as the head of the commission, the guardian of the treaties, the blah, 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 or is she there purely as a politician? Uh, and I think those people will see her there as president of the commission, and that is problematic. Yes, it comes along with the EU flag. So definitely, uh, one will see that as the European Commission representing the European Union, supporting this kind of coalition and government. Any other comments uh, by the participants on this point? Otherwise, just to say that um, we've had a fascinating uh, conversation and a set of presentations that bring to the forefront uh, once more uh, the starting premise of this webinar was this, uh, the, the profound relevance of uh, integrity, impartiality, rule of law um, when it comes to European public administration and how the, the, all the rules and procedures and so forth, all the bodies and so on, boil down to uh, ensuring the effectiveness and uh, uh, delivering for those who actually uh, are affected by this, ultimately, uh, the people, the peoples of Europe, uh, citizens. The, uh, and um, there have been very concrete uh, ideas and, um, and proposals, uh, both from the panel and the participants, um, as to how to to take into account um, not only in light of the upcoming European Parliament elections, but also the output, uh, the expected output um, of these elections and what's coming up in terms of the new interinstitutional landscape in Brussels, the new European Commission, uh, including the new European Commission. Uh, so we are very grateful to have had this conversation. Um, thank you to all the panelists and thank you to all of you who are still connected. Um, this uh, online event will be posted in YouTube, so it will be available for uh, some of you who may be watching now and you are not participating in this uh, conversation uh, live. And from Seps, uh, big thanks and uh, let's uh, stay in touch.